Jessica here, the Ferrari Family Coach. Thanks so much for joining me here today. Um, if you're watching this live or if you're watching a replay later on, um, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Either way, whether you're live or whether you're watching a replay, um, go ahead and uh, post in the comments. Let me know you're here. Let me know you're watching. Um, this video is about three tips um, the three top things you can do to improve the health of your pet. And then I put that there is a bonus, uh, fourth tip that I'm going to give you. Um, so let's get started. First off, before we go into the three things that I want to talk to you about, I want to talk to you a little bit about why these things are, um, some of the most beneficial things you can do to improve the health and well-being of your pet. And uh, just real quick, before we get started, go ahead in the comments. Um, again, whether you're watching this live, whether you're watching this on a recording, I get notified anytime you post a comment. So I can always come back. And if you have a question, post it below. Post your, um, I'll, obviously I'll have your name. Post your pet's name, what type of pet you have. Um, and let me know what you're currently feeding your pet and how much exercise your pet currently gets. Um, so we can start there. And again, thank you so much for being here. We're going to talk about, um, in my opinion, the top three things with a bonus fourth tip um, that you can do right now to improve the health of your pet, whether you have a um, dog, whether you have a cat, whether you have a multi-pet household. Let's talk about the things you can do to improve their health right away um, and why. So again, before I tell you the three things or actually the four things, because there's a bonus fourth tip, let's talk about why. And I want to address um, there, there is a lot <laughs> of kind of arguing going back and forth on social media between pet parents. And the first thing I want to say before um, I address what this arguing is all about and my position on it, we need to learn as a society, as humans, somehow we have forgotten how to learn, how to engage one another in educational debate. Um, obviously, we're all entitled to our opinions. Hopefully, our opinions are based on fact. But I also understand that with the internet and today, it's it can be difficult to figure out fact from fiction. Um, because anybody can post their opinions online, uh, between blogs, writing articles, even some of the statistics that we can find online are incredibly biased. And I um, I am a science major. I have my degree in psychology. So learning about um, how science works, um, we know that when, when a scientific study is performed, um, what we like to think happens is that all of the data is collected, we average it all out, figure out what the result of that study has concluded. Unfortunately, there are a lot of biases in scientific studies. And a lot of times we have to look at where the funding for a study is coming from to see exactly what that bias is. and. Um, you know, there are all kinds of different things that can happen in scientific studies um, between, you know, having you know, um, uh, data come in that is like way below or way above the average data and we just throw those out. They don't matter. They do matter. But according to the scientific study, they don't matter. You can find all kinds of ways to skew your data to say what you want it to say. So it's really important, even when we're looking at statistics and scientific research, to do our own research and figure out what biases that study may have in it. For example, if we know that a study has been conducted on 
um, salmonella in a raw food diet, who is funding that study? Well, big pet food manufacturers that are producing millions and millions and millions of pounds of kibble every year obviously don't want our um, pet parents, us, to start feeding a homemade or a home prepared or any type of raw food diet that we either prepare on our own or we buy commercially because it hurts their business. So are these pet food manufacturers funding those studies? I don't know, check it out, find out. Um, so I'm kind of getting off track, but there's a lot of information that I wanna give you. So I'm gonna try to give it to you as quickly as I can. Um, there is a big debate and their pet parents are pitted against pet parents on social media right now in this I should feed raw food to my dog and cat or I shouldn't right and there are really really um, volatile emotions on either side of the debate so it's really easy to get locked into your mindset that I'm right because I read this online and um, I know I'm right. So anybody that says otherwise is wrong. And then of course, added into that, fueling this um, argument is the anonymity of the internet, right? You're not standing directly in front of somebody talking to them. You're not, um, you know, <laughs> thank you, Kim. There's a dog barking outside. and. My dog is gonna uh, obviously bark back. So you're not you're not engaging in a physical conversation with somebody where you can stop talking and start listening. First of all, because that's one of the things we're not doing is we're not listening to each other. So let me address first of all both sides of this debate. Okay. And I actually recently had somebody on uh, my, my fan page uh, <clears throat> tell me that she would never feed her dog a raw diet. It didn't matter how good of a diet it would be because she knows that there are entirely too many recalls of raw dog food and she's so much safer with feeding her dog kibble. Now, I get it. I understand where she is coming from because she's getting her information from huge companies and huge corporations who are supposed to be her animal's advocate. In reality, these big pet food manufacturers are not our pet's advocate. They make money hand over fist and anything that comes along that could um, change or, or make them less profitable, they're going to fight tooth and nail, right? Like that's just what is going to happen. So let's just talk first of all about um, these salmonella recalls. Now, there is a difference in good bacteria and bad bacteria and Raw food diets contain both, okay? Now, with a healthy dog, a healthy cat, they, they are designed to ingest their prey as they kill it. So it is raw. So their digestive system and their gut is designed to combat that bad bacteria while taking advantage of the good bacteria. And the more good bacteria that is in their gut, the better adept they are at fighting off the bad bacteria. Now, there's also, um, and I hope I don't get this wrong, a, a such thing as pathogenic bacteria. And what that means is that it could cause you to become sick. Now, salmonella is, pathogenic, but you have to have certain levels of it. So um, for instance, and I was watching a video um, from Rodney Habib the other day, and we're going to talk more about what was in that video a little later on in this video, but he pulled his doorknob off of his door. Your doorknob is covered 
in bacteria. Is it pathogenic though? Probably not. You can have it tested, you can swab it and send it out to a lab and test it and find out. But this is the kind of thing that we're, we're looking at. These, the FDA is attacking raw food, um, pet food manufacturers for having any amount of bacteria whatsoever, which is completely unrealistic and also not what we want. First of all, let's realize that's not what we want. We do need bacteria. We do need, um, especially the good bacteria. So to kill the bad bacteria, we have to kill the good bacteria. And if we're doing that, then we are not providing the nutrition to our pet. Thank you. Kim. Thank you, baby. I know, I'm sorry. We're not providing the nutrition to our pet that we're, we're setting out to do in the first place. Um, so let's talk about these recalls, okay? Because yes, you're gonna hear a ton about any type of raw food recall. That's very intentional. But there are so many more kibble recalls for salmonella than I bet you know about because they're not making headlines, right? The pet food manufacturers are not out there going, hey, guess what? We just had another recall for salmonella. No, they don't want you to know about it. So I um, just took a peek real quick at the Truth About Pet Food, uh, their website. Uh, Susan is an amazing, amazing advocate for our pets. Thank you so much for all of the work you do, by the way, Susan. And um, so salmonella recalls, um, and I'm just, I'm taking this directly off of the website and she's pulling this information directly from um, the FDA, okay? So pet food recalls for salmonella, June 2010 through June 2015, so a span of five years, there were 23 salmonella recalls in kibble and 14 salmonella recalls in raw food. That's a big difference. Also 26 salmonella recalls in commercially made pet treats. So when you're looking at these big pet food manufacturers between the kibble and the treats they make versus the raw food diets, you're at like three times the number of salmonella recalls. Now, and I'm just gonna scroll. Um, the number of individual pet foods recalled for salmonella, the same period, same five year period of time, June 2010 to June 2015. Kibble had 78 individual pet food recalls in that five year period, five year span. 78 salmonella recalls in kibble. Raw food had 27. So when you come and tell me that, that you're never going to feed your dog a raw diet because there are entirely too many salmonella recalls in raw food, well, there are a whole heck of a lot more in kibble. You're just not realizing it because they're not telling you about it. So if that's the reason you're, you haven't switched over to a raw food diet for your dog or your cat, it's not really a reason. Um, and you know, this information is out there again. You just have to know where to look and you have to know how to um, figure out what's fact and what's fiction on the internet, right? So um, salmonella is not an issue. It, it's a non-issue, in my opinion, when we're feeding a raw food diet to our healthy dogs and cats. Now, if you have an immunocompromised dog or cat lightly cook it and you're good to go you're set right so you're you need to provide that nutrition to your dog <clears throat> so let's get into um the top three things you can do to improve your pet's health right now um now that i've talked to you kind of a little bit about why this whole thing came up and why i wanted to talk to you about it in the first place. So if you're a kibble feeder and the majority, like 90 something percent of the United States is a kibble feeder. Um, and why we're kibble feeders, I've done, I've done videos about that, but it has a lot to do with the second world war. But the majority of the United States feeds kibble to their dog or cat. Um, if you're a kibble feeder, here's the first thing 
you can do. Tip number one. Um, check the ingredient label. First of all, and I, I need to grab something, one second. I did a video not long ago, and I'm just gonna pull it up. I can, I can post it down in the comments. Um, the first thing you need to do when you're checking the ingredient label is figure out how much of that pet food is carbohydrate or sugar. And this is how you do it, okay guys? You take protein, which is shown on the label. And I did this in um, the previous video. I took just a can of cat food that I had in my house. It's the Weruva Pollican chicken, um, which is King Tut's favorite right now. Um, he is a little sick, being a little finicky about the food he's eating. So this is one of his favorite foods right now. And um, anyway, you take the protein percentage, fat percentage, moisture percentage, and the ash percentage. And um, just as a caveat, not all pet foods are going to list the ash percentage. So the average um, that we will use is 6% if ash is not listed. You take all of that, add it up, subtract 100, and that percentage that you get is the total number of carbs, which are sugars, in the pet food that you're feeding. Obviously, the lower the number, the better, and this is a can of wet food, um, so it has a ton of moisture, so you know there's not a whole lot of carbs and sugars in this can of cat food, which is amazing. We Ruva is actually one of the best um, cat food brands that you can find today on the market, commercially available, if you're not feeding a raw food diet. So this is the first thing you wanna do when you're looking at the ingredient label. The second thing you wanna do is actually look at the ingredients, okay? Um, and I told you before, I was gonna talk a little bit more about a, a video recently that Rodney Habib did, um, where he talked about, and this is a term that he coined, the salt divide. So I wanna show you how you figure out the salt divide. So what I did was I went to um, Google and I said, what's the best selling dog food on Amazon, right? So the best selling dog food on Amazon is Taste of the Wild, uh, High Prairie, is that it? High Prairie Canine Recipe. So I found that Taste of the Wild Kibble High Prairie Recipe is the number one seller on Amazon. So then I went to the Taste of the Wilds, which by the way, right now the Taste of the Wild is in a huge, huge lawsuit. Um, oh goodness, I lost my, okay, there we go. I lost my network connection. So the Taste of the Wild is in a huge lawsuit right now um, because pet parents have found that um, their dogs were getting sick and the pet food has been tested and Taste of the Wild right now is in a huge lawsuit because the amount of lead found in their kibble exceeds, immensely exceeds the amount of lead found in the water in Flint, Michigan. Now we know how big of a deal it is, how incredibly polluted the water in Flint, Michigan is. It's headline news and a lot of us have probably forgotten about it if we don't live in Michigan, but their water is undrinkable. The amount of lead in their water is astronomical. Now the taste of the wild has been tested and um, some of their kibble has been found to have a load more <laughs> lead than even the water in Flint, Michigan. It's a problem. Anyway, it's still the number one selling dog food on Amazon. So I went to the Taste of the Wilds website and I got the ingredient label. So let me show you how you figure out the salt divide, which is a term that Rodney Habib coined. So this is the ingredient label. I'll see if I can get this all on the screen. So what is happening here? I'm going to stand up so I can kind of see what you're saying. So what is happening here is that if a pet food is um, meeting AFCO requirements, uh, which is the regulatory um, 
uh, it's the regulatory company for pet food. It's called AFCO. If they're meeting and their bag will say, if they meet AFCO requirements and Taste of the Wild does, then they cannot have any more than 1% salt in their pet food and what they sell to you. So what that means when you're reading an ingredient label, when you're reading an ingredient label, it goes from what is in the highest percentage of the food all the way down to the lowest percentage of the food. So if a pet food meets AFCO requirements, then they cannot have more than 1% salt. Now, if they have 1% salt, then everything after that on the label is 1% or less. So when you're reading the label and you find salt right here, again, thank you, Rodney Habib, for um, filling us all in about this amazing information. So you find salt on the label. Everything after that is 1% or less in this bag. Now, there are just a few things that I wanted to point out to you on this particular bag. Um, the yucca root, blueberries, and raspberries, all less than 1% in this bag. Now, we know blueberries are amazing, right? They're wonderful. Um, they're a superfood, right? So we want we want some blueberries in, in the food that we feed our pets. Um, uh, dogs especially, maybe not so much cats. They don't really need a ton. They need a lot more meat. But <clears throat> the other thing I want to show you on this ingredient label, we've got peas, right? And then we've got pea protein. We've got potatoes and then we've got potato protein. What's really interesting about this is that pet food manufacturers will take an ingredient and divide it up and say, well, yeah, we have whole peas over here, but we're only using the pea protein over here. Now, if you were making food, you wouldn't divide your ingredients up that way. They do it so that they can put peas and potatoes further down the ingredient label than the meat right? So if you were to add the peas and the pea protein, the potatoes and the potato protein, would they actually exceed the percentage of meat in the ingredients? Very, very possibly. Otherwise, they wouldn't divide it up that way, okay? So um, that's, that's one thing. One thing you can do, actually two things, when you're reading the ingredient label, the two things you can do to pick a better kibble for your pet. If you're gonna feed kibble to your pet, and I understand, I completely understand um, that some people have to because it's the only thing they can afford. And honestly, if it is, then it is. Feed the best you possibly can to your pet. That's all anyone is asking, right? Just do the best you have the ability to do for your pet. Um, the other thing you can do when you are picking out a good kibble, and I'm kind of going to go on another tangent here, guys. I'm sorry, but I am. Um, <clears throat> another thing I learned from Rodney Habib and have looked into, and oh my goodness. So when kibble is being made, they take all of the ingredients, the meats and the vegetables and blah, 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 and they put it all together they mix it all together and cook it up. And what happens when you cook it? Because kibbles in general are high heat processed. And I've done other videos on this as well. Um, and I can link to them if, if you are interested. <clears throat> Just let me know in the comments. And I can uh, link a video, link that video to you so you can read all about the high heat processing and how Detrimental that is not only to the health of your pet, but to the nutrition in the kibble. Um, but that's what they do, okay? They mix everything together and they cook it all up. And 
the high heat processing depletes the nutrients from that food. So what are they gonna do to put nutrients back in so that their food meets minimum nutrient requirements, according to AFCO, um, to provide the nutrition to your pet? Well, what they do is they put in, they take all of the um, vitamins and minerals and they're, they're um, chemically made. They take all of the vitamins and minerals that were depleted from cooking and they add the, the chemical compounds of those um, vitamins and minerals that are now lacking. They add them back in in a chemical powder form. Now, when they're doing this, every, it's called a premix, okay? And a premix is, again, chemical compounds of all the vitamins and minerals that your pet needs. So, um, all of these premixes are made in China. And they come over to wherever this pet food is being manufactured, wherever your pet food is being manufactured, and they're added back in to um, that food. So that now, when that kibble is finished, it, mean, it meets minimum nutrient requirements according to AFCO standards for your pet. Problem with that, and this is where all these vitamin D recalls are coming from, where the vitamin D levels are so high, they are toxic and they are killing thousands of pets. Because all of these premixes are coming from China. And what happens is um, these chemical compounds of all these vitamins and minerals are being shipped to your pet food manufacturer from a Chinese company. And what should be happening is that that premix should be tested by um, an independent third party laboratory and reported back to the pet food manufacturer that yes, all of this premix is good, right? Well, that's not happening. They're using the premix, they're putting out the food, they're putting it on shelves, they're stating on their websites and on their packaging that they are testing every bag of food, every can of food, so that bite to bite to bite to bite, your pet is getting the exact same nutrition that you expect from one can to the next, from one bag of kibble to the next. Well, they're not doing that. And that's why they're being sued. Pedigree, or I'm sorry, Hills specifically right now for the vitamin D toxicity. What should be happening is that these premixes are coming in, being tested before being used to create your pet's food. That's not happening. But what you can do is contact the manufacturer of the kibble that after you've done all of your research and decided, okay, this is the kibble that I think is going to best fit for my pet and the budget that I have, contact the pet food manufacturer and ask them for the third party um, testing of the premix coming in. If they're testing the premix, which they should be, they'll have no problem providing that to you. If they're not testing the premix, They have nothing to give you. So when you're picking a kibble, those are the best tips that I can provide you right now today. So that's tip number one, all of that. <laughs> all of that is kind of tip number one, right? When you're picking a kibble for your pet. So let's go to tip number two. You've done all of that. You've found the kibble that's gonna work best for you, that you are satisfied, you're convinced that this pet food manufacturer is putting out the best product they possibly can. It's meeting the nutritional needs of your pet. They are third party testing the premix. You know that everything is good. Tip number two, okay? 
whenever possible, and I understand you can only do what you can afford to do, but whenever possible, whether it's once a day or once a week or once a month, add in whatever fresh food you can to their diet. So whatever you can do, take, take half or a quarter, however much of kibble you would normally feed them out of their bowl. Take as much as you can out. Maybe you can do a whole meal um, once a week. Maybe you can do a whole meal once a day. Maybe you can do a whole meal once a month. Maybe you can do a quarter of a meal once a day. Whatever it is for you, take that much kibble out of their bowl and replace it with fresh foods. Chicken, beef, turkey, sardines, um, raw eggs, goat's milk, raw goat's milk, amazing stuff, right? Kefir, um, carrots, blueberries. The sky is the limit, guys. Um, anything that is safe for your dog that is going to provide valuable nutrition to feed them that fresh food, add that to their bowl. That's the second tip that I can give you. The third tip is to transition your dog to a completely fresh food, raw food, biologically appropriate, species specific, balanced diet. What does that mean? <laughs> that means that you are providing 100% of your dog's nutrition with fresh whole foods, raw foods, unprocessed um, foods. Um, you know, you can, you can, you can find commercially available foods that are made for you. Um, two of, there are, uh, a lot of them out there now. Some of them are good. Some of them are not so good. There are, um, a good number of ones out there that are really good. Two of my favorites are Answers Pet Food. That's absolutely number one on my list. Answers Pet Food. And the second one, which is probably the most convenient for and, and cost effective um, for anyone that asks me, for anyone that I privately consult with, the most convenient and probably one of the more cost effective is going to be Darwin's Pet Food. Um, and I actually have an entire video series about transitioning your pet to a raw food diet. So if you're interested in that, you know, put your hand up, put a comment below. I'll be happy to provide you a link to all of that information. Um, so those are the three, top three tips for instantly improving your pet's health. Um, and of course, guys, I promised you a bonus fourth tip, right? Because it's not all about nutrition. Like a lot of it is about nutrition. Um, but just as with us, it's about nutrition and exercise. So get out there and exercise with your pet, um, with your dog. Take them for a walk, take them for a hike. Make sure they're getting um, all of that excess energy out every day. If you have a cat, play with your cat at least 15 minutes a day. But if you can do, you know, two or three 15 minute sessions, on point, all right? Get your pet the nutrition they need, get them the exercise they need, and you will have a much, much healthier pet. Um, both of these things, nutrition and exercise, I talk about in my new ebook, Seven Miracle Steps to Train Your Dog. Even if you have a cat and you don't have a dog, the principles in this book are gonna be amazing. They're going to completely change your mindset about how you view your relationship between you and your pet. Um, they, if you are interested in training your dog, they are going to set you up on the right path to begin training your dog. I highly recommend it for every pet parent. Um, I put a, I think I put a link in the description. It's been a little while now because this video has gone a little long and I apologize, but there's so much information I want to get in your head. Um, and, uh, but if you, if you want to post below and help people out, bit.ly forward slash the number seven steps dog training. Post it below. I'd appreciate it. Um, so what did you learn? Guys, did you learn anything? 
post it in the comments below. I'd love to hear about what you learned, what maybe you're going to do a little bit more research on. I'd love to hear about that. Um, and everything I showed you in this video, I'll post uh, links in the comment below so you can look at it for yourself. Um, because that's what this is about. First of all, as pet, pet parents, we need to stick together and, um, you know, listen to one another, understand where we're coming from, help educate and stop bashing each other because we are not going to advance and um, pro be able to provide our pets with the better life, the better nutrition um, that they deserve if we're constantly at each other. Because if, if we are, they win, right? If they can convince us that this highly processed, um, full of carbs and sugar is spot on exactly what your pet needs, if they can convince us of that, guys, what else are they convincing us of? Um, you know, you're not going to live off of, you're not going to eat a bowl of cereal three days a week or three meals a day, seven days a week for the rest of your life. We shouldn't be feeding that to our pets either. So, um, but again, I completely understand whatever you can afford to do for your pet, do for your pet. And anytime you can take, you know, even if it's just scraps of food left over from where you're preparing your meal, if it's, if it, if it packs that nutritional punch for your pet, give it to them because it's, it, it, it's only going to be better than, um, the, the highly processed kibble in their bowl. So if you have any questions, please post in the comments below. I know I went over a lot of stuff, um, but this is what I'm here for. I'm here to help help you make your and your life, your and your pet's life better, improve the bond between you and your pets. That's what I'm here for. That's what I love to do. So go ahead and post in the comments, ask away, and um, grab your copy of the seven miracle steps to train your dog. You will not be disappointed. And uh, yeah, with that, I will see you in the next video.